health meeting um, for today. Um, prior to um, starting, I was, um, Ms. Franklin has a few motions that I will defer to. You're muted, um, can I? Still muted. Can you hear Strong. me? Yes, ma'am. You can hear me now, correct? Okay, yes. Great. I make a motion that this board conduct its regular meeting today, August 6, 2020, rather than the second Thursday in August. Second the motion. All in favor, okay. raise your hand. All right. Is there more there, Ms. Franklin? More. The items, I make a motion that the items on the meeting agenda constitute essential business of this board. Meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans considering the COVID-19 outbreak and any rule conflicting with the governor's executive orders permitting electronic meetings shall be suspended. There's a second for these, the last second set of motions. David Frank, Frederick, I saw all in favor, raise your hand. Great. Carol, are you, can you get on video? Or else I have to do a voice I call. I, I thought I was. You're not. But are you in favor of this as well? Yes, you can't, oh. can you hear me? I can hear you, I can't see you. That's fine. Um, all right, so this motion's carry. Thank you. Um, listen, um, we have, um, Approval of the July 9th minutes. Um, is, is everyone had a chance to review the July 9th? Is there any discussion or a second for approval of these minutes? I make a motion to approve the July 9th minutes. Ms. Nams, there a second? Okay, Mr. Frederick. Um, all in favor, raise your hand. Aye. C Carol, are you raising your hand? I need to hear from you. Okay, so a um, couple of things we're going to do just a slightly maybe different. Um, first of all, I don't want to go any further than to introduce um, Dr. Calvin Smith, our newest board member. Dr. Smith is a system professor at American Medical College as well as an assistant dean of admissions. Um, a, a wonderful uh, background from college at Morehouse to a Meharry medical student in an internal medicine program um, trainee at Meharry, and now assistant dean of student or admission, excuse me, which I think is is superb. Um, welcome, Dr. Smith. We look forward to your your time and expertise in this crisis. I will say one other additional thing is Dr. Smith has been really critical in Meharry's response to COVID, um, and so his background in that aspect I think will be very critical to us. So, Dr. Smith, thank you for joining us. Welcome to say something if you'd like. Um, I don't have very much to say other than thank you, Dr. Jahanger, and uh, hello to all of the people that I'm meeting for the first time. I'm glad to be a part of uh, this board to help assist the, city, the citizens of the city of Nashville. We're grateful Welcome. to have you. Thank you, sir. Welcome, Welcome Dr. Smith. Yeah, we're, we're very excited to have you. Um, one, um, Dr. Caldwell is, is you had you had texted me about a desire to move the, the discussion around the um, contract up early um, because you had some guests there. Is that still, Doctor? I believe you wanted Doctor Hildreth to be available in the conversation, and I'm okay with that. Uh, yes, that's right. And I was trying to see if he had joined. Uh, yeah, I don't see him listed. I, I'll ask oh, if he no. has joined. Well, we, all right. Well, well, while we're any discussion there? Okay. Well, while we're doing that, Mr. Henderson, I'm going to just hold off one second. I do want to discuss the deliberation of the end of date for declaration of public health emergency. Um, if you all remember, and Dr. Smith, this has got a background for you, is um, in in March, so I forgot what date now, 15th or something like that, maybe um, 14th, we declared a public health emergency, which allows everything that we have subsequently done from the directors, public health orders, and so forth, including the mask mandate, to continue. We had agreed that every month we will review this. The current one ends at the end of this month. Um, 
I would like, to, I would appreciate a motion to continue this for another month till the end of September because um, we are making a dent finally in our in this crisis, and I think these this is an important tool in that. So, with that said, I'm happy to have discussion and or uh, motion to extend this till the end of September, as it currently expires at the end of August. I move approval to extend to the end of September. Mr. Frederick and Carol, I see a second. Any discussion further around this? All right, all in favor, raise your hand, if you will. All right, looks unanimous, Carol, thank you. All right, anyone opposed or abstain? All right, carries unanimously to the end of September, thank you. Is Dr. Hildreth on now? All right, if not, I will go back in the menu um, to Mr. Henderson. I, Trevor, I know you've done a lot of work on overdosing. This is such an important topic right now, so please. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I am also in the room with me is Angie Thompson and Josh Love, so they're going to be participating in this also. And we just need to put up uh, a presentation on the screen. So I think uh, whoever's got control as host, I think you need to let me be able to do that. I have passed you presenter, Trevor. Great, thank you. Give me just one second. Um, sorry. I don't know if anybody's seeing this or not. Sorry, we're having a bit of difficulty on this end. Oh, here we go. Apologies. No problem. And I think if you didn't have too much difficulty, could you orally deliver? There you go. There we go. Sorry. Took a moment. Okay. I'm assuming you can all see that now. Um, <clears throat> yes. Um, we wanted to thank you for the invitation to present this information um, on the continuing overdose crisis. Uh, we especially wanted to thank Dr. Campbell for requesting regular overdose updates for the Board of Health, which I believe you now get in your packets. I also wanted to thank the Division of Behavioral Health and Wellness that hosts and supports this work. Uh, this presentation is to help inform and empower you to look at your regular overdose reports and also to see opportunities where you might be able to engage with this work going forward. As most of you know, nationally, the opioid and overdose crisis continues to get worse. Locally, this crisis get, it continues to deepen and get more complex. Uh, we want to provide you with some context for understanding the reports you now receive. A quick overview of some of the activities we're undertaking to address this crisis and how this work intersects with the Mayor's Behavioral Health and Wellness Council. And lastly, we will be uh, asking you to uh, continue with your attention to this issue. Um, as we go through the next slides, we'd ask you to try and hold any questions to the end. Um, at this point, I'll hand it over to Josh Love. Good afternoon, everybody. So before we get into the update, I would like to orient the board with the report that has been included in your packet. This report is broken down into two sections, data and current interventions, activities, and collaborations the program is conducting. The data provided in this report are analyzed by utilizing our locally developed drug overdose surveillance system, which allows our team to stay situationally informed of acute events and emerging trends regarding this epidemic. The metrics presented within are derived from three of our data sources and are monitored daily to understand the following. Fire EMS response to suspected drug overdoses in the community, non-fatal drug overdoses admitted at local emergency departments, and fatal drug overdoses reported from the Davidson County Medical Examiner's Office. The table on the first page breaks down these data sources by month and compares where we are at now to where we were in 2019. As you will see here and over the next few slides, we continue to experience an increase in drug overdose activity across all our metrics. It is important to note that while the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the mental health and wellness of our community, 
The local drug overdose epidemic has been growing for several years and markedly began to intensify around the end of 2018. So here, the figure on the right denotes the number of fatal drug overdoses in Davidson County by year going back over 10 years. Last year, Davidson County reported 468 fatal drug overdoses, the highest number on record. Through the end of July this year, there have been 360 drug overdose deaths with an average age of death yes, of 40 years. What? Okay. Um, in terms of years of life lost, which is a measure of the average years a person would have lived if he or she had not died prematurely, the deaths reported so far this year average over 35 years of life lost per person. Compared to the same time last year, fatal drug overdoses are up 40% and are on pace to eclipse 600 deaths this year. It could be as worse as upwards of 650 deaths given where we were as of June 30th or the midway point. The principal driver in these deaths is fentanyl, which has been present in 75% of toxicology reports this year. Again, coinciding with the COVID-19 pandemic, we have observed an increase in the amount of fentanyl in the community, especially in recent months. Like fatal drug overdoses, non-fatal drug overdoses have been on the rise as well. The figure below compares emergency department visits for non-fatal drug overdoses between January and July by year with a summary total to the far right. As you can see, local emergency departments have reported a 31% increase compared to the same time period last year. Figure below here compares our suspected drug overdoses requiring EMS response over the same time period as the last slide. As you can see, suspected drug overdoses are up 42% compared to last year. Another metric we monitor is the number of naloxone administrations per patient encountered um, by EMS. This metric has also increased over the last several months and is currently at 2.3 administrations per patient potentially indicating stronger drugs and narcotics in our community. We also continue to monitor trends regarding race. Among fatal drug overdoses, the majority of deaths in 2019 and 2020 have occurred among the white population, followed by the black African-American population. However, we observed a fatal, an increase in fatal drug overdoses among the black African-American population this year during March and April with fentanyl present in over 87% of these toxicology reports. Similarly, among non-fatal overdoses and suspected drug overdoses, we have observed similar, similar trends by race. I appreciate your time. If there's any additional data you would like to see, please contact me, I'd be happy to assist. I'm going to pass it back to Trevor now, thanks. Thank you, Josh. We also wanted to give you a quick overview of our current efforts to try and identify people at high risk of overdose, people needing connection to treatment and ultimately saving lives. We currently participate in two main grants. These grants both build on the work of the other and complement the work of the other. The first grant is our Comprehensive Opioid Abuse or COAP grant, which comes from Department of Justice. Under this grant, we plan to initiate a fatal overdose review panel. We hope to use this to better identify opportunities to intervene and save the lives of others at risk of fatal overdose. We will be facilitating regular stakeholder meetings where we can share the kinds of data and reports that you now receive and additional information to better direct resources and interventions in our community. And we will continue to develop our overdose surveillance system, which has been built from scratch and has taken a lot of effort to combine multiple data sets. We are continuing to explore how we can use this data and these reports to identify trends, patterns, and related, and related to overdose activity. Again, the goal with all of this data is to try and save lives. The second grant is our Tennessee Department of Health um, CDC High Impact Area Grant, or HIA. The HIA area was defined by Tennessee Department of Health as the counties in Middle Tennessee that on a regular basis see most overdose activity. There is uh, also a West Tennessee HIA area and an East Tennessee HIA area. With this grant, we plan to replicate some of our efforts under the uh, DOJ COAP grant in a, an additional three counties, Montgomery, Cheatham, and Rutherford. 
partnering with the Mid Cumberland Regional Office. We will be assisting in the facilitation of multi-sector stakeholder meetings in these additional counties for the purposes of identifying opportunities to save lives and reduce harm. Expanding our overdose surveillance and reporting activities to also cover these counties. Um, this will be helpful to Davidson County as overdose activity in each county impacts all the others. The grant will also fund positions located with, uh, in our Metro Health Department clinics that will assist in identifying those struggling with substance use disorder and link them to treatment where possible. The HI grant also funds positions for a post-overdose follow-up effort. This will include a position with the Nashville Fire Department EMS and positions with the Mental Health Co-op to rapidly identify and link to treatment at-risk clients post-engagement with fire EMS for suspected overdose. Additional activities that will be related to both grants. Uh, in development is an acute overdose response plan. This plan allows us to use our surveillance activities to identify overdose spikes or unusual overdose patterns, to alert key partners in a timely manner, and to direct resources to address this activity. Key partners to alert might include first responders, hospitals, naloxone distribution organizations, and access points to treatment. A response plan will be developed for all of the HIA counties. OD map. OD map um, is a system uh, to monitor suspected overdose incidents pulled from the fire EMS system in a close to live time frame. It does not include patient identifying information. We were able to implement this system in June of this year, and we plan to start using this tool with key stakeholders to again direct resources to overdose hotspots in a timely manner. The system also has a spike alert function that we are exploring at the moment. Our overdose surveillance system, this deserves its very own mention. A tremendous amount of work has been done gaining access to relevant data, understanding the different data sets and how to use them together to gain a better situational awareness of what's going on with this crisis. We are now at a place where we can monitor overdose activity on a close to daily basis. We continue to develop our capacity with this data and are now looking at how and when to share appropriate reports with relevant stakeholders. Partnerships, we have developed an extensive network of stakeholder relationships, both locally and nationally. Everyone working to the same end of reducing overdoses and saving lives. We have listed a few here. They range from prevention to treatment, from first responders to hospitals. What has been unusual for public health in this effort is the extent that we must develop relationships with those in public safety and law enforcement while still respecting our particular responsibilities. These relationships ultimately lead to sharing of appropriate information and resources, resources for the purposes of saving lives. As we move forward with implementing the elements of these grants, all of these partners will play a vital role in our overdose response. I will now hand over the presentation to Angie Thompson, the Director of Behavioral Health and Wellness Division. Angie will bring you up to date on the work of the Behavioral Health and Wellness Advisory Council as related to COVID-19 and overdoses. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, first, I wanted to talk a little bit about what the Behavioral Health and Wellness Advisory Council is. This was established by a mayoral executive order in May of 2018. And some of the functions of this include developing behavioral health priorities for Metro, promoting public and private collaborations, and serving as an advisory function to the mayor's office and to Metro government. At the end of uh, at the June 4th meeting of the council, Mayor Cooper requested recommendations to address behavioral health needs related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Leveraging the behavioral health subject matter expertise presented uh, represented on the BWAC, five priority areas were identified. The priority specific to addressing uh, overdoses is on the screen. And that is to stem the tide of rising fatal overdoses in adults in, in crisis due to chronic mental illness and substance use disorder exacerbated by the pandemic, social distancing requirements, and economic downturn. The overdose-related uh, recommendations uh, centered in two areas, crisis care, detox services, and prevention and access to naloxone. 
The areas under uh, identified under the crisis care detox area include increased demand for services, spikes in overdoses, shortage of space and detox programs due to isolation and quarantine policies. And with respect to the prevention and access to naloxone, areas identified were increased access to recovery support and information. There's a lack of support groups and increased isolation are, are triggers for relapse and overdose. And we also, the group noted that fear is keeping people from accessing treatment. So increased access to naloxone and information is needed. After the full five priority areas that were identified by the BWAC were discussed with the mayor's office, the health department submitted a $5 million request to the COVID Financial Oversight Committee to address those pressing behavioral health needs. At this point, we are open for questions um, and we appreciate your time and attention. I am gonna put up on the, the screen uh, how you can get back in touch with us as well. So at this point, we're open for questions. Thank you so much. Um, would you mind closing your screen so I can see the whole everyone? Is there any questions from any of my colleagues? I'll close this Okay. Thank you. It allows me to see people a little better. Um, any of the board members have any any question? Okay. Well, I, I'm grateful for what you guys are doing. It is a really a sad reality of the implications of, of this uh, and the mental health and substance abuse issues that this crisis is adding to. So, thank you for your hard work there. Very welcome. All right. So I just wondered if they could briefly say um, which which organization um, they're most in, in in conjunction with 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 the work. I mean, sorry. Can you repeat that again, Carol? Can you are you able to repeat that question again? Did anybody oh, catch the question? Is she with you there tonight? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. I think it might be my microphone. Oh, okay. So last time, um, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Press on. Okay. okay. The question is, if you could just cite a couple of the organizations that you all are most engaged with in trying to to do this outside of the metro ones that you cited. Yes. Um, so more on the, the the treatment end of things, mental health co-op has been a huge um, asset and partner in this. Um, foundations Recovery have been very engaged with us. Um, um, the National Prevention Partnership, um, who do a lot of the naloxone distribution in the community, have, have been very engaged. Uh, Tennessee Department of Health, um, again, the, the ones we did list, Fire Department, Police Department, um, the Appalachian High Intensity Drug Area, CDC Foundation, um, yeah, we've, we've had no lack of very engaged partners. It, that's been a real blessing in, in this crisis, despite um, it being a very complex issue. Um, there's no problem getting partners. Terrific, thank you. All right, anything else? I, yeah. I, do, Is it, I do appreciate this update, so please keep us posted. I have had a couple of questions from members in the community regarding uh, opioid overdoses. Um, so thank you, this is very timely. Well, we're happy to talk to anybody at any time, so please point them our direction. All right, well, thank you. So we're gonna just veer just slightly, um, as, as Dr. Caldwell has invited Dr. Hildreth, who I'm grateful is always is on this phone call um, or in this meeting regarding our discussion around approval of contract with Clinical Research Associates. Um, as preface for this, for people who may not be aware, um, the department has has um, is in discussions with clinical research associates to 
somehow participates so that we as, as a department and us as a city are taking uh, phase three clinical trials for a vaccine. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Caldwell and, and um, Kate, Kate Stone and, and all the other individuals who have been very uh, involved in, in getting to the details here. I know it's taken a lot of weight, a lot of um, work, and in a minute we'll let kind of let you guys talk about it. I do want to, as this dialogue continues, what I want to make sure and I verbalize this privately, Dr. Caldwell, and, and just want to make sure I verbalize it publicly, is, is I wanted to just as you as we have this dialogue, please recognize my initial hesitancy as um, given the historical perspective of public health department, um, kind of not ours, but in general, sometimes been known to do things that are un unethically or experiments in the name of vaccination. Again, not our department, not our city, not our state, but it is something um, that has happened previously uh, in the past decade to vulnerable populations. And so this was done in the name of medical advancement and vaccinations. And, and this actually led to, for, for those listening, to the National Commission for Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical Research, which is where the IRB process has come from. Um, and, and so the, for me, transparency is critical as we move forward. Um, I also want to recognize the importance for our department for, for trust, um, because while, it's, while I, I think our most critical function as a department is when a vaccine is passes phase four or enters phase four and we just wanted we want to make sure that vaccine goes around to everyone as dr heldred said earlier vaccination is more critical than getting a vaccine because we want to get to that herd immunity number of everyone having immunity so part of that is having trust in our department because we will be the public facing component of that and i want to make sure any trial that we may participate in is um doesn't erode that trust. And then finally, as we have this discussion, Dr. Caldwell and team, I really would love to talk about, um, you know, why the need for us as uh, to be the third third potential site for um, all the tr clinical trials, given that our colleagues at Mary Medical College and Vanderbilt University are two large um, academic medical centers are doing this, and the impact on the workforce that is already very stretched in our department. So I just wanted to set at least some of the di discussion around that. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Caldwell. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Uh, we, we have had the opportunity to uh, brief each one of you individually uh, in depth about uh, the work that uh, we uh, have done to get to this point to present our information to you today. Uh, I've asked Katie Stone, who is one of our uh, assistants here, it's also a lawyer who has helped put the contract together to provide an uh, overview. And then Dr. Joanna Shawkai-Kai will uh, follow up. And then I've asked Dr. Hildreth to provide some thoughts and then we can uh, proceed with conversation from there. So Katie. Hi everybody. Um, it's great to get to talk to you all again about this. Just um, to give you some specifics of the contract itself, first and foremost, uh, this is a contract for, it's basically a service agreement uh, type contract for our doctors, Dr. Caldwell, Dr. Bailey, and Dr. Shaw Kai to, to help participate with clinical research associates in the clinical trials that they will be uh, facilitating with respect to the COVID vaccines. So Clinical Research Associates is a uh, research com company that has been around um, for about 30 years. They've participated in a, over 650 clinical trials and uh, they have been approached by several different companies regarding uh, participation in these clinical trials for phase three vaccine uh, trials for COVID. So um, then Clinical Research Associates was looking for some other, other people to help with the studies because they are looking for so many participants. I believe the Tennessean had an article today about one study where they're, they're um, seeking around 4,000 participants. So it's going to, they're gonna need a lot, of, uh, a lot of help with this. And so they asked the health department if we would be willing to assist. 
the only staff that would be obligated under this contract are the three doctors. So none of our other staff, none of our nursing staff, anything like that. Additionally, our clinic spaces are not going to be used for any of the trials that would be clinical research associates and other spaces. So uh, the resources from our end are the doctors. Additionally, we are um, going to be helping to facilitate some of the recruitment, but we are not very specifically not going to be trying to actively recruit health department patients. So um, that recruitment is going to look more like if somebody calls into the COVID hotline, we would, and, and they wanted information on a clinical trial, we would direct them not only to the clinical research associates trials, but to any trials that are happening in Nashville. So to Vanderbilt, if Meharry was participating in one, to Meharry, it'd be just sort of a general overview of all of them. And we also see that as a great way to be able to educate the community on the importance of vaccine trials, along with any risks and benefits associated with it. Uh, lastly, within the contract, it, it, is also, it also contemplates that we will help with interpretation services, but that would most likely be more through the language line um, than any of our direct employees. And that is really to facilitate this all-inclusive effort to make sure that we really get a good pool of candidates that really represents Nashville as a whole. Um, let's see. Beyond that, um, Metro is not going to be out anything for this contract. The clinical Research Associates would actually be paying, uh, reimbursing us for expenses. Um, and let's see, Clinical Research Associates uses, they will have an IRB that will be approving all of the protocols of this. They use Western IRB which is the same IRB that Meharry Medical College uses. So um, it is a, it is a well-known IRB. And I believe also Celia Larson, is she still on the call? Yes. She runs the internal IRB. So if you had any questions for her regarding how that's going to work, um, this is not the type of uh, trial that our IRB would generally be dealing with. So um, that is why you know, Western IRB would be dealing with it. So um, I guess with that, unless Dr. Caldwell, you have any, you want me to add anything else at this time, if uh, Dr. Shaw Kai Kai can take it right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Katie, thank you. I think you covered uh, most of it. Uh, hopefully you all can hear me well uh, with the mask on. Um, and uh, Dr. Jahanger, thank you for pointing out as far as the public health and um, the uh, vac some of the vaccine studies and um, you know some of the issues that have come up in the past, and we definitely are aware of it. And uh, we value the trust that the um, public have in us. Um, and uh, from one who was uh, part of the IRB at Meharry for uh, several years, um, I hold that dearly and definitely um, any protocol that comes our way, we definitely will make sure that there is um, equity and that it's, um, that there's nothing that's going to uh, disadvantage one group over uh, the other. Um, you know, with uh, Department of Human Services and uh, NIAID uh, have proposed the Operation Warp Speed, and that's for um, uh, vaccine companies to try and produce a vaccine for um, to help fight, fight against COVID, to help prevent COVID-19. Uh, uh, infections by the end of 2020. Um, and so um, with CRA being approached by several uh, companies, um, they reached out to us, as Katie has said, and um, it's a great opportunity uh, as a public health um, department for us to um, 
be in the community and offer uh, this, uh, to be a part of this. Um, we, uh, we realized the uh, stress, you know, already in the health department, and that was something that we made sure that uh, CRA was aware of, because uh, they have their need of uh, nurse coordinators, phlebotomists, pharmacists, but we made sure to uh, let them know that we just didn't have the staff. Uh, Dr. Caldwell, Dr. Bailey, and I will be some of the providers that will be um, doing a medical evaluation of the uh, participants for the studies um, and uh, to help with my work, uh, we will uh, be hiring a nurse practitioner to help us in the clinic so that none of the clinical services are interrupted. Um, and I will still continue to oversee that uh, person. Uh, Katie touched on the, uh, on the uh, recruitment. We definitely will not be trying to single, signal, single out, excuse me, our uh, patients that come into the health department. Uh, uh, we will, if they ask, there will be information. We will have information via the, um, the hotline and the uh, uh, social media platforms. We also, before those are sent out, we'll make sure uh, that um, it has gone through the IRB uh, approval process. And if the Board of Health would like to see those, that are, that's fine. We'll work with our community uh, leaders and the organizations that we currently have relationships with. And also, uh, we know there's concern also about the uh, uh, certain communities. We'll make sure and work with uh, the mayor has a, a religious uh, a group of religious leaders so we want to make sure we uh, get out there and educate and get the information out about all the vaccines that will be um, available. Um, I, uh, looking at the uh, some of the phase two, phase one trials of the uh, vaccines that are going to be uh, in the phase uh, going on to phase three trials, they are, are fairly. The, the reports have been fairly safe so far. Most of them have been injection site reactions and uh, usually some Tylenol or Tylenol or NSAID has um, taken away the discomfort. Um, the, uh, and the efficacy so far uh, from the phase two studies have been uh, promising. So um, hopefully we will have, we will be able to be a part of this in addition to um, Harry and um, Vanderbilt. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite Dr. Uh, Hildreth just to provide some uh, thoughts. He's uh, available to us also. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Thank you. Caldwell and Dr. Jahanga. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, say a few words. Um, I mean, I'm clearly very excited that Nashville is going to be have a robust uh, presence in the vaccine uh, evaluations. Um, I made it a point to ensure that Meharry was a part of this because I think it's so very important that the participants in the study reflect the whole population, uh, black, white, old, young, um, especially vulnerable populations. Um, I do think that there are some concerns about having the public health department partner with a private institution to do something like this, but I also think uh, there are some possibilities to, to make sure that the right questions are asked, and that the emphasis is placed where it needs to be. Um, and I should also say that there's a precedent for something like this right down the road there at uh, Meharry and, and Vanderbilt. We have a Center for AIDS Research that's been around now for a long time. And three years ago, we incorporated the State Department of Health into our CIFAR because the state health department was playing such a big role in HIV prevention, and that helped to inform some of our research. So I think it's not an unprecedented thing to have a health department sort of aligned with an organization that does research. However, this is a little bit different because it's a for-profit uh, organization, and that they do these sort of trials for, um, that's how they make their 
their revenue. That's what they do for a living. Um, we are also going to be involved in this. As you know, Dr. Paolo invited me here to be a partner with the health department in partnering with CRA. And our role is to provide some, some docs to be involved in the same way that Dr. Caldwell and the other physicians there would be to evaluate the participants, do the medical exams, um, and do the follow-up. Um, let me just say, generally speaking, that we use Western RRB, and I think it's a great organization for doing these kinds of things. So I think that there's no issue there. I also would echo what was said previously that the phase one and phase two studies of the three vaccines that I'm most familiar with have shown them to be fairly safe. The only thing that you see is injection site reactions that can be dealt with uh, pretty straightforwardly. And the vaccine protocols do not vary a, a great deal. I mean, the vaccines themselves have some differences in the kinds of vaccines they are, but the protocols are fairly standard. And uh, I think, in fact, the phase three protocols for this, for one of the vaccines that I'm most familiar with, be exactly the same as it was for the phase two. So. I think that as long as there are the right uh, oversight in place to make sure that we're protecting the, the participants, which I believe will be the case here, that there are some, uh, there are some advantages to having the health department be a part of this. But I've expressed my agreement with some of the folks involved that if the face of this effort were to be the public health department, that might create some challenges uh, that might uh, not be insurmountable, but they would be certainly significant because trust is a huge element here. And, uh, you know, we work really hard in the area to engender trust in the community because it's so imperative that African Americans and other people of color be involved in these studies. And so the trust piece is just fundamentally important. And that may be one of the reasons why CRA felt so compelled to ask the health department to be a partner, because we need to have trust in order to get people to sign up to be a part of the, the trial. So I'm in favor of, of, of vaccines being done in Nashville. And unfortunately, Nashville was chosen because we are not, <laughs> we at least at the time weren't doing such a great job of controlling the virus. But not, that notwithstanding, I think that having a robust uh, uh, presence in the studies will create lots of ambassadors to help us recruit others when the vaccine becomes available. So all in all, I think it's a positive thing, but I do think there are some, there are some things to be concerned about, but they can be managed. So with that, uh, thank you, Dr. Caldwell, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg. Um Dr. Caldwell, any more of your presentation? I want to maybe tee this up a little bit, if that's okay, sir. Uh, no, that concludes uh, everything we presented. I'd like to thank Dr. Hildreth for all of his guidance, as well as his time and uh, his ability to provide some feedback with our Q&A. All right, so just to tee this up, what the board is being asked to vote on today is a essentially a memorandum of understanding contract that allows us to engage with clinical research associates in the way that the contract was worded. Um, that's it. And and this, if approved, then this then stone, if I'm not mistaken, will then be taken to the council. The city council would then have to approve it, at which point it becomes an executed document, um, which will allow us to engage with clinical research associates. Um, and then at that point, Clinical Research Associates would then work with the department, right, Dr. Caldwell, for um, to whatever protocols and and so forth. Um, and then and then there'd be safeguards or ways that one could stop at each step. Um, one question that I, I do want to answer. So that's so there's two questions there. One is yes, this is, that's what this is, right, Ms. Stone? Is it all just an engagement document, right? Yes, correct. Okay. Um, the next question I had was, um, Dr. Shaikaka had mentioned that uh, we'll be hiring a nurse practitioner to help her with her patients in, in the health department clinics. Um, is that an additional expense for the department or is that a, is there a funding mechanism there that would come out of this? Uh, I, I answer. Uh, this uh, will be able to be um, paid out of two two ways. 
Uh, one is the, the COVID funding, because they're still in the public health emergency, to help backfill her duties at the TB. And then we will uh, bill uh, CRA. Once, once we get that, then we will not need to uh, have the uh, money um, paid for by COVID funding. So, so we could kind of front load it a little bit with the COVID fund, but primarily CRA will pay for any of our expenses. What about the, what money are we talking about will be paid to you three? I mean, you guys, I would assume, I don't have the numbers from you, are the three most expensive employees we have. Yes, um, our time will be uh, billed uh, as we work to CRA. It will come to the Department of Health as uh, you know, general fund uh, monies. We, we are not getting any additional dollars ourselves to do this. Oh, so, so, so if, you know, potentially, uh, you know, we could really go a long way to helping backfill our, our salaries and help uh, Nashville, Davidson County. Okay, thank you. Um, questions from my colleagues? Anyone have any questions? Are you shaking your head, Ms. Franklin, my small computer, or Carol? <laughs> He's got a dialogue with us here. Who, who, who wants to ask? I got all my questions answered in one call. I'm good. Thank you, David. So uh, thank you uh, to the health department staff that spent a lot of time bringing us individually. I was able to have two conversations, a lengthy conversation with, with Katie, and then um, also a, a, a good conversation with the physicians and with Katie. So thank you for that. I want to make sure that I reiterate um, what everyone else is saying is that that theme that's the ultimate goal, making sure that our community, particularly those that are most impacted, receive vaccines when they are available. And the clinical trials are a very important part of the process. I am in support of clinical trials overall for the COVID vaccine. I do have some concerns, um, and I'll just re I took some notes, so I'll briefly run through them, and um, hopefully um, those questions can be answered. Uh, one, I, I would like more clarity on the amount of compensation per patient that will go to the general fund that Dr. Caldwell had mentioned. Um, I would also um, like to reiterate the concern for um, what we talk about in the field as human subject abuses in the past and making sure that participants of clinical trials that we do our due diligence with making sure that those safeguards are in place. I understand that Western IRB um, is the IRB that's very familiar with these types of clinical trials, but I also love the opportunity for our IRB to really lean in on racial equity and health equity, with a racial equity and health equity perspective, if it gets to that point uh, that the contract is approved. I'm concerned about not about voting on something without seeing the protocol. Um, for me, that's very important, and and I have concerns about being able to actually see what that protocol is. Um, but I understand, I understand why we can't see it right now. But that's the that's the tension that I think we have with the health department being in the state, as opposed to our partners, Meharry Medical College and Vanderbilt. Um, who are definitely well positioned and have the capacity uh, clearly to execute clinical trials with the COVID vaccine. Um, and because of that, I'm wondering what the urgency is. I, I was wondering, Dr. Hildreth and, and maybe Dr. Caldwell, if you can speak to the capacity that we have in national overall um, of being able to engage enough participants to participate in these clinical trials. Is Meharry and Vanderbilt not enough? Um, and if they're not enough, then is the health department the very next choice, or do we have other hospital systems that could also plug in? I'll stop there. I know this is going to be a lengthy dialogue, but those are the most pressing concerns that I'll have. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, I, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Katie to, uh, Katie Stone, to answer the clarity on the compensation issue. Yes, so um, within the contract, you'll see under section three compensation, um, 
the health department is actually the the board of health sorry you all would be approving determining and approving at a later date the compensation amount so um that can be determined by uh, whatever means you all see fit do we have an has a, has a number or approximate number for amount for patient um, participant? Uh, has that been discussed? Do we have a ballpark number that we're starting with? Um, how do we drive that decision to finalize the number for participant? Uh, no, uh, an amount has not been determined at this point. I mean, I. I I don't know that I could recommend one way or another to you, but uh, the doctors will be keeping track of the amount of time they spend per patient. Um, so if you work on sort of breaking down an amount per patient or you know, for their amount of time that they spend doing that versus their other work, um, that would that would probably be the way to to best go about it. Um, but we haven't. It is a per patient. Generally speaking, it would be re reimbursed by Clinical Research Associates on a per patient basis. The amount just isn't isn't there at this point, and that's why we left that open so that we could determine at a later date and, and so that the Board of Health could be the ones to decide that ultimately. Uh, uh, thank you, Katie. Um, as uh, uh, for the uh, uh, safeguards issues, I have Dr. Uh, Shaw Kai Kai to respond to that. I think you can see the height difference. He has to lower his uh, camera. <laughs> Sorry, it looks weird. Um, so, you know, as physicians, um, we're uh, to uphold the Hippocratic Oath, and that's something that we all, you know, take dearly. Um, also, we will make sure that every protocol we read through carefully and is sent to, through our IRB in addition to Western IRB. Uh, with uh, all trials, the um, safety profile and the results are uh, consistently and routinely reviewed. Uh, and so to look for anything that is concerning. Um, and also um, the uh, participants will be given a number they can access at any time there's a concern or a problem that develops. Um, yeah, okay. okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharkai. And uh, as for uh, the question regarding urgency and protocols, I'll, I'll give a couple thoughts and I'll ask Dr. Hildreth to follow up. Um, the, the protocol, uh, once they become more available, will, uh, and parts of it, uh, or a sum, synopsis of it, uh, will be on the clinicaltrials.gov once it's uh, more public. And, and that'll be uh, one place, and we will continue to look for uh, places that we can share as much detail with each of the board members uh, as possible. As, as for the urgency, uh, well, clearly we have this public health uh, emergency where we keep uh, hearing that it's the vaccine that's gonna enable us to, to get back to our normal life. So that is a great urgency. The fact that so many uh, vaccines are wanting to be tested, uh, we would like to uh, support uh, the request of clinical research associates to help augment and amplify their efforts. Uh, while Vanderbilt and Meharry do have some capacity, the Department of Public Health has the ability to help amplify those efforts in partnership. Uh, and uh, I'd just like to remind the Board of Health too that I have great experience having uh, participated in uh, 18 clinical vaccine trials over my career. Uh, also, when I was previously a uh, Director of Public Health. So this is something that I have great experience with as well and can help uh, provide oversight as well as uh, experience and uh, knowledge to, to, to the community and, and to help our, our community learn about what, uh, what clinical research is, uh, how these vaccines work. And I think overall, 
amplifying these efforts will provide opportunities to connect more and educate the community at a much higher level about COVID. Even those who don't choose to participate in the trial will be interested in it. They'll want to learn about it and they'll be uh, really closely connected. So hopefully when one of these or more vaccines get approved, we will already hopefully have great experience with them and could provide even that greater amount of information to the people of Nashville, Davidson County uh, about what uh, these vaccines uh, are. So Dr. Hildreth, if you could also just provide your uh, thoughts. Thank you. Sure. sure. Uh, I think the question was regarding capacity for vaccine uh, studies here in Nashville. I mean, clearly the, the institution with the greatest capacity is gonna be Vanderbilt, given the large number of clinical investigators they have on board, because that's one of the limiting factors in terms of how many folks you can enroll. Uh, we also have capacity, not nearly as much as Vanderbilt, but we do have capacity. As I said before, we're part of Operation Warp Speed, and the assignment that we've been given is to try and enroll 300 uh, folks my target is actually double that. And we have a specific focus though that's a little bit different. My focus is to try to get, my enrollment at Meharry will be open to anybody, but our focus will clearly be trying to get as many African-Americans as possible and Latinx individuals en enrolled as possible. So I think there is a lot of capacity and we don't quite yet know what the appetite is gonna be in Nashville for for uh, participating in these studies, but I'm anticipating that it is gonna be robust. And I based that on the fact that there's been such tremendous interest in the, the webinars, the, the, the press conferences, the fact that people have bought into and engaged in the mitigation things that we put, on, we put out there for them. So I expect that in Nashville, there is gonna be success in enrolling individuals in the studies. Uh, but I really can't speak to whether or not there will be enough capacity because we really don't have a sense yet of uh, just how many people will be interested. But I do believe it's going to be important for us to drive the interest to make sure that we do get as many people as possible enrolled in the trial. But there is lots of capacity here in, in Nashville, I think. Thank you, Dr. Elder. Mr. Clayton, more questions? Yeah. Just to follow up just very quickly, um, two other concerns that I have and, and I'm not sure this question can be answered, but I just want to just show it for the record for participants that are recruited into the clinical trials with uh, clinical research associates. I'm wondering if we can eventually get a better understanding of how much how, how much participants will be compensated for participation in the clinical trial. And also, I just wanted to note for concern that we're talking about three positions three members of our leadership that um, would be engaged in a significant amount of clinic time while we're still fighting up uphill battle with the pandemic and maintaining our regular uh, health, uh, department, health department function. Um, that's concerning and, and I would love to eventually get better clarity on that, but I'm not sure based on what's been shared if we have more that. I'll just stop there and make sense yes. for others. Uh, uh, thank you. I can uh, uh, at least give uh, some uh, feedback for you. Uh, we, uh, with Katie Stone, we will try to our best to see if we're uh, able to provide you what that feedback is for how much each of the participants would be uh, compensated. Uh, I, I have some idea of uh, your previous experience, what the range uh, is, but uh, I, I hope that we can provide you that, that detail. Um, uh, as for the workforce, please know that um, because each of these participants uh, will be scheduled, that there'll be a scheduled times of, um, of visits. So, um, so given Dr. Shaw Kai Kai's ability to be the lead physician on this, she will be able to devote more time. Uh, Dr. Bailey and I, of course, will not be able to devote as much time but we'll be able to carve out specific time so that we will have planned engagements with the clinic. And also, I expect them to be uh, working on Saturdays. And as you know, I uh, you know, will be happy to work uh, any uh, outside hours that I can. I'll try to reserve uh, much of the business hours as I can for the usual business duties. Uh, but you can count on all of us to uh, 
understand, and, and clinical research associates understands this too, is that you know, we are, uh, as you say, the leadership of uh, the Department of Health. We have a lot of duties, uh, and we believe that this is uh, one of them, and we'll make uh, an appropriate amount of time for them. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Carol, please. Carol. Okay, I didn't understand it. I thought you said pickle. Um, well, back to the thing about haste. Last Wednesday, um, we were really, really, really kind of, at least I felt, um, like it was just urgent to get this decided by Friday. And I think the information that you shared, Katie, was that when I asked about the urgency, um, that if we didn't go ahead and get this approved uh, very quickly, that CRA would have to go on probably and use another partner because of their um, anticipated start date. So I was a little surprised, to tell you the truth, when it came back up. Um, and I, I cannot say how exciting I think in general it, it would be and how important it could be but I share a lot of the concerns and, and probably beyond what Tine has, has um, brought up. Insofar as um, it isn't just about reimbursement, it is about the fact that the workforce is going to be impacted by this. I don't care how careful we are, and there's an awful lot of unknown. The workforce. I think, and, and Dr. Caldwell, I'll just ask you directly to share with us, what is the general temperature, if you will, or the general sense of your senior management team with regard to going ahead with this? And if it's positive, if you could share some of their rationale, if it's not positive, if you could share some of that, it would be really helpful. Uh, I, it's a learning experience for uh, a number uh, of our senior leaders, but as you know, uh, Dr. Bailey, Dr. Shakaikai, Katie Stonell uh, have been uh, also part of the clinical leadership team. So we are all uh, very uh, much supportive and working through a lot of the questions and concerns to make sure that we are doing the best job we can. I've also asked uh, some other colleagues to go in depth with some of our other members of the management team. And Dr. Shaw Kai Kai was one of them. And I asked her to provide uh, sort of her feedback for some of the things that, that she had heard as well. I think that might be uh, useful for you also to hear. Out of respect for time, um, I'll just be brief. Uh, I spoke to a few of the uh, ELT uh, colleagues, and uh, one of the concerns was um, the pull on staff. You know, as you all have mentioned, um, that you know the staff has been stretched. The tornado and COVID, COVID plus, um, and in addition to our regular duties. Uh, and uh, hearing that uh, none of uh, their staff will be told uh, and taken away from current responsibilities, uh, they were uh, happy to hear that. They were also concerned of um, the uh, clinics being used, and we reassured them that the clinics were not uh, going to be uh, use so service would not be interrupted. Uh, the other common concern was that um, I think a couple of the board members mentioned that this appeared to be uh, rushed uh, or um, all the an urgent matter. Um, and uh, I explained uh, why it um, why you know this was um, moving at a rapid pace um, and. Uh, some of the responses were, as long as it's done right, that uh, they would be uh, okay uh, 
with it. Uh, so, and I assure them that all of us uh, definitely will make sure that uh, it's, the study goes right, you know, um, and because we're concerned for our uh, place in the community. We are public health, as you all have said, and we're a trusted entity and want to continue to maintain that trust. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. All right. Just one last thing. Is that, yeah, I mean, we got, I want to move this along, so please uh, go ahead. It, you know, one thing that I shared uh, with you is this is not an irreversible decision. Uh, if at any point uh, if something comes out that, you know, uh, we feel we want to uh, stop our work, Katie will uh, also reinforce that this contract has got a, an out clause. Uh, so uh, we are proceeding very slowly, cautiously, and uh, can back uh, go back at any time. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to, uh, uh, Doctors um, Smith, Ms. Frederick, Dr. Campbell. Any questions from you three? And obviously, any, uh, anything? I think. Well, uh, I just wonder uh, what about the potential for this being a positive thing for morale, that we're uh, kind of stepping up to be in the forefront of uh, uh, doing something about the uh, virus, and uh, it's uh, kind of good PR for the department potentially, and people feel like they're part of something, uh, something um, beyond just a staid, uh, bureaucratic, uh, um, organization we're doing something kind of special just saying just a comment okay sure dr smith and then mr frederick so my main concerns were about the recruitment process as well as the uh conflicts of interest and those both were addressed in my uh meetings with the with Dr. Caldwell and company. So I don't really have anything else in the issue of being redundant. I don't have anything else. Uh, I do appreciate the, con the uh, comments of my colleagues, and I think that they are, are important issues, uh, but I, I tend to I tend to uh, lean towards the, the uh, opinion that Dr. Campbell just expressed about the uh, morale and uh, the, um, the sense of a, something positive coming out of this. So uh, that's where I sit. Thank you, Mr. Frederick. Do you have? Uh, yes, I, I appreciate the uh, the concerns uh, about the staff and the staff time, but I, I do also feel that it is very important that we be a part of this uh, and just have to trust that the professional leaders that we have hired to run the department will scale this back if it needs to be. So uh, I'm in favor of it. Thank you. Um, and, so before um, Ms. Franklin, I'll, actually, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Well, I just, two, two questions. Can you just help us understand a little bit more about the logistics in terms of where are, where are you going to be doing this? And, um, and when you talk about the money coming back to the general fund, I thought I understood what that meant, but I'm not sure I do. How does the, the health department benefit if the money that you're billing for goes straight into the general fund? How does the health department receive that? And also, where are these places going to be? Uh, oh, okay, uh, Mr. Diamond, I see you're getting ready to speak. Would you like me to address it? Yeah, thanks. Sure. Uh, Every fiscal year, we, when we prepare a budget, uh, we, we prepare uh, budget revenues and expenditures. And so, um, you know, prior to the start of this year, we had no idea this was going on. So this revenue wasn't budgeted uh, as part of this fiscal year. So it really wouldn't benefit the department uh, in this current year. So maybe uh, for next year, for fiscal year 22, if we knew we were gonna have X amount of dollars coming in in additional revenues, we could request additional positions or any other future expenditures tied to that budget. So um, the, the answer to your question is really not much immediately. It would just go to Metro uh, as a whole, uh, unless we were to to ask, uh, you know, Metro Finance for, uh, you know, if we needed an additional position or anything else, if they would allow us to, to do something with that money in the current fiscal year. 
Yeah, and uh, Mr. Dime, uh, how much, I mean, we, we are very dependent upon Metro to fund us anyway. So, I mean, it, it's sort of, even though it's going to Metro, it is, it's all a part of us. Correct. We don't we don't op operate a, a profit and loss uh, business. So, um, but any additional revenues coming in, um, you know, can be made. Our case can be made for additional expenditures or positions uh, going forward. And where where will this take place? Yeah, uh, the Clinical Research Associates has uh, some space, but they have limited space. Uh, at least one of the clinical trials uh, are in the process of producing uh, medical trailers, which uh, will be outfitted completely uh, with the, no need for the Department of Health to do anything but except house them uh, in our uh, parking lot area. And, and that will be uh, figured out uh, once we get more information specifically about the trailers. And I'd, I'd ask uh, Katie if you could just provide uh, a follow-up on that. Um, yes, so the trailers, the trailers are um, specific to one particular trial in the event that is, um, that is the one that Clinical Research Associates goes with. They, they could be located in, out in, one of the parking lots, the upper parking lot of Lent, but uh, there's also the possibility that they could go somewhere else on Metro property, it, it, somewhere else within within the county. So, um, but for now, Clinical Research Associates has a full second floor that they are planning on using to conduct the trial. All right. Alex, I've got one more question. I'm one sorry. more question, and then, and then that's fine. Yeah. If, if you could clarify, um, since neither of the three or either of the three of you would be a principal investigator, what exactly will your role be if there is a difference of opinion about some aspect of this trial? Um, I'm trying to understand, do you think that if Dr. Shaw Kai Kai or Dr. Bailey and I don't agree on something, is that what you're asking? No, I think he's asking what if you don't agree with what they're doing? Oh, yeah. well, if we don't agree, I mean, we each value uh, our professional license and we will choose not to participate. I mean, is that the question? I'm, I'm not sure if I'm hearing it right, Dr. Jahangi. Well, I just right. don't know how much, um, since, since, I don't know, do you know who the principal, you don't have to say who it is, but do you know who the principal investigator is or who they are? Well, I, I mean, there are a number of vaccine companies um, and uh, you're, you're well aware of my background, having been a clinical researcher as a principal investigator, as well as I have previously been employed uh, by uh, a vaccine to uh, vaccine cover. So, so uh, at least both of my the previous um, experiences, yeah, I know a number of people that are actually part of the development process at, at a number of companies. And if you're asking, do I know the doctor at Clinical Research Associates? I, yes, I, I know him. I have not practiced side by side with him, uh, but um, I, you know, yeah, I feel very confident. No, let, me, let me let me try maybe let me try asking it a different way. If Carol, if I'm just tell me if I'm understanding your question, Carol. There is a there is a there is a protocol. Most studies, if there is a disagreement on on protocol, period. Um, there is a a group of investigators that meet and say, hey, there's a disagreement in this protocol. We'd like to amend this, or we'd like to do something different. What, yeah, what yeah. Ms. Etherington is asking is if there is a disagreement from the Metro Public Health Department and how a protocol is to be conducted, do we, do you three as the physicians who are liaison and plus whomever may be working um, elsewhere, have any ability to impact that protocol? And if not, what recourse or ability do you have to not do the study? Is that, Carol, is that a fair way to some, maybe ask what you're asking? Yes, yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay. Well, um, it, it goes back to the IRB, uh, and the IRB is a very 
involved with every detail of the process. And if any uh, patient, volunteer, investigator has any concern, they can have that concern uh, brought to the IRB's attention. And it's the IRB as well as the FDA. They have a data safety monitoring board, which very carefully monitors the study as it's ongoing. So there are uh, uh, a, a number of complementary bodies that are looking at this. So at any time, Dr. Bailey, Dr. Shakai Kai, I have any concerns, we have ways to express those concerns. And, and as well, if we're not satisfied, we, we don't have to participate. Okay. Okay. Ms. <laughs> Franklin, one question, please. So, so this is a this is a situation in which those of us that have been in that have, have careers or have careers in health and public health have studied and 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 pondered and deliberated about what if, and so we are at that intersection now. So the United States Public Health Service study of syphilis at Tuskegee is at the root of the mistrust in in the narrative across the country on whether or not individuals, particularly people of color, will participate in clinical trials. And we need them to participate in clinical trials, and most importantly, we need them to receive the vaccine when it is at the appropriate time. However, trust and distrust and mistrust is at the core of this. Our health department has already made a decision in which mistrust was at the root of it, particularly around sharing a COVID, COVID positive results with Metro Police Department without a, a process um, being transparent or vetted. That there's mistrust already that we're having to work build up again. There will be mistrust whether or not it's in Harry or Vanderbilt leading clinical research trials. And I, from my public health background, I believe that there is an opportunity for the health department to assist in this overall uh, uh, movement to get people into the trials by providing education um, and be able to answer questions in an unbiased environment. That is what we do in public health. We educate, we inform, and then we champion opportunities for individuals to receive the treatment of vaccines in order to prevent disease. Now, if we did not have capacity in Nashville, then I would say yes, let's strongly consider this and make sure we do our due diligence as a board, and I'm speaking to my colleagues, to make sure that we understand and we, the buck stops with us, not necessarily the physicians, and we understand what they're recommending. Because if, if something goes less, something goes wrong, it's going to be come back to the health department. It's going to be our reputations, not just the reputations of the physicians for this participating in, in the trial, but I'm talking about the rest of the workforce who we rely on to go out and work with community-based organizations, work with individuals living in public housing, work with students in schools, to educate and inform and pray that they believe us and they trust us when we say that we have your best interest at heart. So there is a conflict of interest with regards to public health, health education, and then that clinical trial space. And I think we really need to be very careful about how we embark on this effort if we embark on it, because I guarantee you our workforce, I'm talking about the people that do not have a decision in the matter, that go out and build those relationships, they're going to be implicated more so than Dr. Caldwell, Dr. Shakai Kai, and Dr. Bain. So I just want, this is an education moment. I hope there's media listening. I hope there are students listening. I hope there are community members listening and facing because we have an uphill battle and we need to come together as a community to do this work right and do it well. I'll stop there. Thank you, Mr. Franklin. I would welcome a motion to approve or not approve this in and, and, and a second, and then subsequently we have further discussion as Robert's rules would allow. So would there be a motion around this contract approval? I'll make a motion to approve the contract. 
Thank you, Dr. Campbell. Is there a second? I'll second. All right, Mr. Frederick. Any further discussion around this? Hearing none, all in favor of approving this contract, please raise your hand or say aye. You can say raise your hand. Aye. All right. Great. All opposed? Okay. All right. Um, motion carries three to two. Thank you. All right. Um, I would like to now discuss um, another <laughs> less controversial topic. That was my attempt at humor. Um, the deliberation of data sharing of interim plan agreement and implementation. So just to put this in context, um, the board approved a data sharing plan, um, uh, that, that a long-term plan that um, is being implemented. We were made aware that would take several months to, to do. And, the, and we as a board had then asked Dr. Campbell to meet with his working group, which again rep had representatives, um, the Human Relations Council, COB, um, I believe Chief Swan, Dr. Campbell, and, and maybe a few other individuals, I apologize, I forgot who that, those are, um, to come up with an interim plan that could be implemented now in, in, um, in preparation for the permanent plan which would be implemented. So, um, Dr. Campbell, would you like to fill us in on what your group has, has come up with, please? Well, uh, one of the sticking points was trying to figure out how the, the, the system worked, uh, which was kind of complicated. Um, and then try to approximate our plan. Um, the detail uh, was nicely written up by Dr. Uh, Stephen Martini, who one of the few people understands the software uh, uh, implications uh, that we needed so much help with. Basically, the deal is um, what we can do is send, the, if we send the information from the health department about the positive test, it goes to a database um, in the uh, law enforcement database. It's then scrubbed, which um, means they check that the addresses are appropriate and it's lined up with the GPS listings. Then it's transferred to the DEC, which is uh, uh, where they, uh, uh, Department of Emergency Communication. Um, they are the ones who would then call uh, the uh, first responders and provide them with the address, which has been checked and is appropriate. Um, our proposal is that uh, would mean that once the data is transferred to the uh, Department of Emergency Communication, the data is uh, deleted on the law enforcement side. The data that uh, is over there in the um, DEC uh, is then um, available uh, in terms of address. Um, additionally, the, the whole thing about uh, how to manage uh, allowing law enforcement uh, to be involved when it comes to transporting uh, um, someone to either to the jail or a mental health facility or ER, that uh, a database uh, um, Excel sheet uh, with specific names would be available, the DEC, and if... Uh, Law enforcement had uh, can specifically call in an emergency when someone has to be transported and ask if this person is on the list. Um, one of the problems with that is it's kind of dependent on the information that people who are being tested provide and might not be accurate. So um, it's all spelled out there, and that's the best we could come up with. Um, in terms of approximating a short-term solution that pretty much um, matches the long-term um, plan, there is essentially no way that there could be any kind of phishing 
for uh, individual information on the part of law enforcement, like a traffic stop and or trying to find out something about somebody personally. The only way law enforcement has access to that data is if they are specifically calling about transporting uh, an individual. Now that's important because, you know, the outbreak in uh, the jail um, uh, that um, has been a source of so much uh, uh, infection um, could possibly have been uh, uh, alleviated or avoided if we'd had, if law enforcement uh, at the jail had had opportunity to have a little more access to data. And um, I think that uh, it kind of behooves us to uh, um, give people who need the tools uh, what they need in the most reasonable way we can, protecting privacy. So that's, in essence, my take on what we worked out. And it was unanimous. Um, everybody participating thought this made the uh, most sense. And do you know when the permanent solution will be able to be implemented? Do we have any update on that? I have no information. I don't think anybody's heard back from that. Dr. Caldwell, do you have any information on that? Uh, would you please repeat your question? Yes, my question is, do we know when the the um, permanent plan that we agreed to will be implemented? Uh, I, I think we have a colleague on the line, uh, uh, Mr. Durbin, I think uh, I see you on. Uh, you may have a better answer. Yes, and I hate, uh, this is Keith Durbin. Uh, I am in here in my role as kind of a uh, connector because the, the person who really has the information since we're dealing with uh, a, a Motorola system is Steve Martini who, who owns that Motorola uh, dispatch application within his area. And I think he's got uh, some updates for us. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Great. Uh, yeah, I'm the service director of the emergency communications department. Uh, to answer your question very shortly, uh, hopefully somewhere around the uh, early October is when we should see that long-term solution in place. Uh, we've coordinated with Metro uh, ITS to uh, to develop that that bridge between our two uh, software systems. Uh, we've sent out a, a letter for approval with our uh, computer-aided dispatch vendor to uh, today uh, to the funding for COVID, to, the CARES Act funding to, to pay for this uh, interface. We should be able to issue a PO, and once they have their PO, they can start work, and we're hoping to see that done in, in four to six weeks. Okay, so this interim solution then will be about a six-week plan. Um, That's what I'm saying. Okay. Any discussion around this interim plan? Um, uh, and it was unanimous, Dr. Campbell was saying. So um, is there any discussion around the interim plan? Alex, can you just uh, capsule it again? Can you just capsule what, what the plan is? Um, positive test results are uh, sent to the database at um, the um, um, law enforcement database. Uh, it's what they call scrubbed, which is correlated with uh, known addresses in uh, GPS locations. It's then transferred to the DEC and um, deleted. The DEC has that information available for first responders about addresses of people who have tested positive and not uh, names. Law enforcement is uh, involved if they have a uh, to transport an individual and um, they can um, request from DEC uh, specific names, which would be provided by the Department of Health to them directly on like an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and this uh, would be deleted after 30 days because people would no longer be infected or whatnot in any event. And this would be the only way it would be uh, specific names would be accessible. So at 3 a.m. on a Saturday morning, they can get that information? 
Right. Uh, I understood from Doctor from uh, Steve Martini. Who could answer that more directly? Who understands the mechanism of all this? The short answer is yes, they can they can have that. With the addresses, we'll put those addresses into our regular computer-aided dispatch uh, database. Uh, they'll, they'll be in that database for 30 days from the, the time that we received that positive test. So as far as addresses are concerned, uh, yes, that will be uh, made available. Uh, that says somebody at this address uh, has tested positive for COVID in the last 30 days. Uh, as for the names of people prior to transport, uh, our dispatchers would hold that list of names and we would uh, query that list and advise a yes or no if that list, that name is on the list and when asked by law enforcement uh, specifically to check the list prior to transport. And that would be 47365. Any other discussion around this? There'd be a motion to approve this temp interim plan. Dr. Campbell is making a motion with your hand raised. Is that right? Yes. Okay. There's a second for this. There's, is, that, is that you, Mr. Frederick? Or yes, you second? I'll second it. I, I do still have some reservations, but I, I understand the, the need to move forward with the interim plan, so I, I will support this one. Okay. Is there any further dialogue or discussion around this? There's been a motion and a second. Yes, Ms. Camp, Ms. Franklin, excuse me. I also uh, still have reservations, particularly around um, decisions to transport, which I know are outside of the body of, outside of the health department, but um, still squarely in the realm of uh, policing in general, um, and disparities in, in policing and who's disproportionately impacted. But I also want to make sure that we move in the right direction of uh, making sure we protect our first responders. And then I will say, having talked to some of the law enforcement folks, that this originally came up for them. Um, and I, I'm sure there's a medley of different ideas, but I heard from more than one that their greatest concern was taking it home to their family that if they were exposed. And I think we have to respect that that is a legitimate fear as well as their, their own well-being. I guess, yeah. yeah. I agree. Yeah. And we need to continue to reinforce that our, our police officers wear masks. So yeah. being that anecdotally in the community is not happening consistently. And so I'm afraid of the people that are being transported also maybe even acquiring the virus from them. Dr. Smith, do I see your hand up? Yes. So I, I just wanted, I, I echo the sentiments of uh, Ms. Franklin uh, pretty strongly. Uh, and, and um, you know, I want to be on record for saying that, you know, any HIPAA violation and name and address of the first two uh, uh, of the 18 identifiers for HIPAA. So we got to be very clear that uh, this, this in and of itself is uh, a violation of HIPAA. But uh, understanding the ex the circumstances that we are in, I think this is the best solution temporarily. Uh, and so, you know, I'm, I'm but I want to be on record for saying that that this is a grave concern, and uh, we really should rethink. Uh, I'm glad that we rethought it. Uh, I'm coming into the party a little bit late, uh, but I think this is a, a, about as good a solution as we can come to for the temporary. Uh, I, Dr. Smith, I just want to correct your uh, review that uh, is not is specifically not a violation of HIPAA. And I'll, I'll give you my thoughts, and then I'll have our lawyer, Mr. Smith, provide. But the Office of Civil Rights of the Department of Health and Human Services have put out a clarifying statement that this is specifically not of any violation of it. As a matter of fact, it's within HIPAA, our ability to share it with certain people. So, Derek uh, Smith, could you please uh, provide at least that legal input so that Dr. Smith um, at least could uh, be aware of, of what that statement was. I mean, I think it's exactly what you just said, Dr. Caldwell, right? I mean, I don't know if Ms. Smith needs to reiterate that. It's it's uh, exactly what you just uh, said. Uh, okay, well, if you agree, I, I was just Please wanted to, uh, yeah. you know, that, that's fine. Yes, that that's what it is. Thank you. I mean, I think that's, that's true. Dr. Smith, I'm happy to give you that. Maybe, Ms. Smith, you can send Dr. Smith that thing, but it is a new <laughs> All right. Um, 
Okay, thank you, Dr. Smith and everyone else. Um, any other discussion around this? All right, so we are voting to approve the interim plan as outlined by Dr. Campbell and his committee um, that will expire once the permanent plan rolls in, hopefully within six weeks. Yep. All right, um, all in favor, please um, raise your hands. Okay, that's five votes, okay. Any opposed? No, there's no one else, and I'm saying, okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Diamond, you gotta just go through both your grants applications and grants and contracts. Uh, yes, Dr. Jahangir, we do not have any applications this month, so I'll move on to the uh, uh, grants and contracts, if you will. Uh, we're a tad voluminous, so I'll try to move it along uh, as quickly as I can. There were uh, eight included in your preliminary packet. Uh, first is our grant and aid from the state, uh, something we receive every year, 725200 Uh Item number two was uh, some emergency uh, COVID money uh, given to us through, this, through the state, uh, 86,400. Uh, items three and four were from the Friends of Mac, um, $20,000 30, uh, uh, Again, uh, to reiter reiterate and for Dr. Smith, anything, uh, donations that come through that specify how the money is to be spent is uh, treated as a grant because we do have to track all those expenditures. Uh, item number seven is our uh, certified application counselor uh, uh, certification uh, through uh, the uh, Medicare and Medicaid services. Uh, item number six, uh, our behavioral health team touched on that in their presentation, the uh, high impact area uh, grant from the state. Uh, item number seven is a pod with the schools agreement. Um, item number eight is our uh, voluntary acknowledgement of paternity, uh, a renewal of that agreement with the state. And there were uh, four additional ones uh, that came through today. Uh, the first two are the, a, a contract with Teletask. And I believe uh, either uh, Dr. Caldwell, Dr. Shalkai are gonna speak on this a little bit more during the uh, director's update. Uh, but this will enhance our uh, disease investigation related to COVID. And item number 10 is the uh, business associate agreement uh, to protect our, our HIPAA uh, information with that contract. Um, item number 11 is a contract with uh, Centerstone for uh, data sharing, uh, also related to COVID. And uh, last item is uh, number 12 is uh, also a contract with the uh, high impact area uh, opioid program, uh, and that is with the mental health cooperatives. So I will do a lot at you there quickly, but I'll answer any questions. Uh, if there are none, uh, uh, we would uh, request a motion for approval. Okay, any discussion around these? So there's a lot. Okay, any, there would be a motion for approval of this. Second. Thank you. I'll take Ms. Etherington, Ms. Franklin. Um, any more discussion? All in favor? Raise your hands, please. Right. Let's see them. Let's look. Mr. Frederick, all right. All five, five. There we go. All right. Thank you. That's it, huh, Mr. Diamond? Yeah. All right. Um, I am going to do this. I'm going to give a director's report because I have a six o'clock uh, meeting. Unfortunately, I can't reschedule. So Ms. Franklin's going to end the meeting. My director's my um, chair's report is really short. Um, you can watch it every day. Essentially, on the press conference, are, the city of Nashville is starting to turn the corner. I am proud of the work we are all doing. There is um, there there there's some um, there's direct evidence that if you look where about two incubation periods from we as a board instilled the mask mandate and subsequently a week later uh, the director signed the order for um, closing bars and we are now averaging uh, about just north of 25 26 cases per hundred thousand three weeks ago we were at 65 cases per hundred thousand i want to highlight 25 and above is still red so i wouldn't high five yet you have to get below 10 to um, be able to go visit your grandparents at the nursing home or whomever you have nursing home. We still got a long way to go, but I, I, I commend this group for having the fortitude to, to do a mask mandate when it wasn't a popular thing to do. And so thank you. Thank you all for that. Um, the, uh, the other 
things are um, in regards to all the stuff we had discussed around um, a bylaws and charter amendment. Um, I don't want you guys to think that business has, has left my itinerary as chair. Uh, I had a conversation with the vice mayor as well as um, as, as well as um, Mike Jamison and, and Tom Sharp and, and Derek, I think, and, and council member Hurt as well. Um, those items are still on the agenda. They are, they will, um, they will, we, we, just to give you background, the week that COVID hit, March 7th, that Tuesday, I was supposed to go and appear in front of a, a council hearing to talk about why we wanted to do it. That was delayed for um, obvious reasons. Um, it will now be back on the agenda and, and whenever the council fills, it, they only get two bites of the apple, as they say, um, to use a cliche. And whenever the next um, bite of the apple is for charter amendments, um, this process will move forward for that. Um, so just so you all know, that is that is that has not fallen off my radar, and I've had a discussion around that this week. Um, and um, that's it. I'm just really excited to have Dr. Smith on board, um, and, and all of you for all your hard work. Um, and I will turn the reins to to Ms. Franklin, but the director's report obviously is, is next. So very grateful to all of you um, for for your time. Sorry, I have to log out. But thank you. Thank you, Alan. Dr. Caldwell, I'll turn it over to you for the director's report. Thank you. Um, I uh, have uh, uh, written uh, items, and then I have uh, in the packet, I have three items that I wanted to review uh, with you. One uh, was just to give you an update on the uh, organizational uh, of the, the department and the uh, organizational chart. Uh, I've continued to work with Dr. Bailey regarding the strategic planning and performance unit that we are putting together, as well as uh, an epidemiological unit. Uh, I've been working with the ELT members to ask them to help me think through uh, if they had a, a blank canvas how the organization might be better structured, and each one of them are in the process of providing me feedback. I'm also going to be reaching out to the entire staff uh, early next week to ask any anyone who may have, want to participate uh, in a conversation with me about what uh, their thoughts and insights might be about how the department could be structured differently or whether the department is just working fine as it is. Uh, I, I appreciate the fund of knowledge and experience uh, all, as well as some of the newer staff and their uh, education, uh, recent education and passion to give me as many ideas as possible so that uh, as we move forward to next month, uh, I can provide uh, to the board, the plan would be a more uh, visionary uh, structure for the department, which would then help us launch for our strategic planning process, which would be uh, concluding by the end of this year. So there'll be more information on that to come. Uh, a lot of uh, recent media attention has uh, turn toward enforcement activity of the face mask order, as well as problems on uh, Broadway specifically and uh, the recent house party. Uh, this has resulted now in uh, a very strong response from uh, Mayor Cooper and uh, his leadership bringing together all of the safety departments uh, of Metro to create a uh, stronger structure uh, as well as a process on how we can move forward to better be uh, alerted to potential events like the party that took place last week, and as well as to be more effective in our strategy to increase compliance with face mask usage and social distancing. Uh, the Department of Health will participate again this weekend from 6 p.m. till about 10.30 p.m. Uh, at the Broadway location in partnership with the police, again, 
as well as other metro park departments to help uh, get the word out and assure compliance uh, with uh, all of the public health orders. Uh, I do have an additional item to preview with you. There will be, uh, there's being developed now an additional public health order. And I wanted to share uh, this with you uh, that our team at the Department of Health and Legal uh, is crafting public health order number 10. And this will address the problem with uh, alcohol usage. Specifically, it's going to be designed to limit open containers uh, of alcohol and consumption of alcohol on the public right of way. This new regulation will apply to several geographical areas, such as Broadway and Division, and is aimed at enabling greater mass compliance and minimizing large crowds on the sidewalk. As bars have been closed, curbside sales of alcohol have led to crowds gathered on the sidewalk, so this will address that. And limiting open containers will enhance mask enforcement by minimizing disturbances caused by the eating and drinking uh, exception to uh, the public health order. Now, the order is not yet finalized, but will be in place uh, in time for improvements uh, this weekend. So there'll be more information to come with that as well as uh, an FAQ document. Uh, I have one final item, which is uh, the teletask uh, technology to help us with contact tracing. And uh, Dr. Joanna Shaw Kai Kai has done a lot of work with that. And we're really excited to share some information about that with you. So I'm going to pass it uh, off to her and then uh, I'll be happy to take questions thereafter. Oh, okay, and, and go ahead and introduce her too. Hello again, I um, want to tell you about Teletask and um, I want to introduce you to Jordan Moody, who is our CDC Public Health Associate. She's been a vital part of our COVID response um, and she's been helping us to work on the uh, Teletask process as a tool for uh, our contact investigation and making sure we're responding rapidly. So I'll turn it over to Jordan. Hi there, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, Teletask is a company that provides secure communication services between healthcare professionals and their clients and patients. Um, and MPHD would use the Teletask system as another form of outreach to our COVID-19 cases in order to more rapidly establish contact um, between the health department and these cases. Um, Teletask um, has been used here at MPHD pre previously, um, specifically in our immunizations program, um, as a way to sign send immunization reminders to homes. Um, these reminders and text messages, especially as they would be used for COVID-19 purposes, do not contain any protected health information. Um, we would simply use Teletask's one-way messaging services um, to provide isolation instructions, um, a link to a Tennessee Department of Health red cap survey where cases can enter investigation data, and then a phone number here at the health department um, where cases can call with any concerns or questions. Um, and we, the system supports scripts in other languages, and we will make sure that um, anyone that needs assistance um, for any means, whether it's literacy um, in English or another language, um, can speak with someone over the phone um, to uh, complete their investigation. Thank you. Any questions from the board regarding telecast? I'm sorry, could you repeat your question? I was asking the board members if, if, if they have any questions for, for you and, and Dr. Shanghai. Okay, go ahead, Carol. I was just wondering if you were having any difficulty recruiting interpreters. <laughs> No, I would not say that we are having um, difficulty with that. We have, we do have um, Spanish-speaking investigators that are on our full-time um, staff to help with our investigations um, and have successfully been able to um, reach out to patients in other languages using our translation services. Okay, thank you. 
Right, and Jordan, this is meant to, to make the contact tracing process more efficient, correct? Correct, and to more rapidly reach out to cases. We can reach, we can reach out to hundreds at one time. As opposed to now, can you give us an idea of, of how that compares to our capacity now? Uh, yes, yeah, so the um, benefit of teletask would be rather than an investigator having to reach out to one case at a time, they could, um, we could reach out to um, cases in a larger uh, manner within a matter of seconds um, and still conduct those um, standard interviews with some of our cases, but then if the case counts on a daily basis rise above the capacity of our investigators, um, then we could implement the teletask system to reach out to those other cases. Okay, great. And, and then the last question I have, I'm, I'm wondering about if, um, if a, a resident in Nashville that is engaging in teletask, if they have questions that they want to reach out to talk to a real person, what does that process look like? Yes, yeah, so the teletask message would include the phone number here at the um, health department that goes up to our regional health operations center. Um, and there is someone there that answers that phone um, and returns voicemails um, so that we can address those questions that need to be addressed over the phone. Great. Thank you, Jordan. And Dr. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is excellent. Thank you. Really great work and really innovative technology. We're really pleased to be able to uh, continue to look and identify ways for us to build efficiencies and uh, and and hopefully take some of these best practices and be able to adopt them for our other programs uh, once we get through this difficult period. So thank you. Uh, any questions about the uh, Committee of the board members. No? Great, thank you, Dr. Caldwell. And um, I I know that you're also continuing to meet with each of the board members, so that's another opportunity for us to engage you. So I really do appreciate the work that you and your team are doing. Uh, I, I am uh, amazed uh, and grateful. We Everybody is working so hard. And, and please let me also say, I, I am making uh, mental health, emotional health a priority in trying to make sure everyone takes care of themselves. Uh, and there have been some really, uh, some leadership moves by some of our ELT and other members by sort of taking that moment to take, to, to take time off and uh, and it has enabled others to realize that they can do it too. So uh, it is so important and uh, appreciate uh, all of uh, the work of, of everyone in our department, but just know, please take care of yourself too. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the next item on the uh, agenda for our meeting are the Board of Health requests. And um, at our meeting on July 9th, there were requests that we made of Dr. Caldwell and his team, and I'd like to go through that, um, particularly the outcome. Uh, Dr. Caldwell, I was wondering if you could speak to the outcomes of the requests that were made at the, at the board meeting last month. Thank uh, Yes. Um, I was uh, hoping Dr. Wright would be able to talk about some of the feedback uh, from the Siloam uh, community health workers uh, used to uh, improve the process. I'm not sure if he's on. I don't think so, but I, I'll be able to uh, uh, follow up more on that with you. Uh, uh, the Board of Health orders uh, how they are uh, being developed um, well, I, I just provided you some feedback on that. I, we, we try. Uh, fortunately, this was a good opportunity for that. I, I think I will continue to uh, try working with Dr. Jahangir on maybe at least uh, 
texting or calling or, or something to let you know as, as things are, are being evaluated. Um, uh, we got the interim data sharing policy group that's been provided and the, uh, the grants and contracts are there. So, so I uh, will uh, provide uh, to the board the uh, feedback from the Siloam community health workers in a, in a written uh, feedback to you, since I know Dr. Wright has most of the details on that. Thank you. And this is an opportunity for us to now ask uh, for, for next month, ask Dr. Caldwell and his team um, for any items of concern that we have. And, and Dr. Smith, I know this is new to you, but this is just a way for us to um, ask questions and give time um, for that information to come back to us. Um, so if there's anything that you're interested in knowing, this is an opportunity for us to do that. Of course, you can do that also in, in between our sessions. I'll open it up to our members to see if there are any particular items that you uh, have questions about that you would like for us to consider for the next meeting. I would like to hear from the school nurses there'll be a month into school. And just to give us an overview, it doesn't have to be a, doesn't have to be a presentation per se, but just what the challenges have been and what seems to be going well. Okay, thank you. So um, in addition to that, I was also going to ask that we have an opportunity to maybe, um, maybe there was a presentation with regards to schools in general, um, mm -hmm. the pros and cons of, of how contact tracing will occur in, in MTS schools. I think that there's not to just understand the, the nuances of that process and the pros and cons. And I think that in, in addition to school nurses. So what what considerations are are we looking at with schools and school nurses? Dr. Smith, Mr. Fudge, Dr. Campbell. I currently have nothing uh, to request. Thank you. Nor do I. I'm just interested in uh, making sure we continue to get the reports about uh, the uh, overdose uh, of the opioid epidemic. That's good data to have. I agree, thank you. And and, and I, I know that there was um, a mention of you, Dr. Campbell, thank you for uh, encouraging that presentation. I do appreciate that. I do have one more request. Um, previously, at a, I believe it was the June meeting, I could be mistaken, um, but we had a commitment from Dr. Caldwell to uh, provide an update for his process for understanding his, his onboarding, um, onboarding uh, goal. And so I would love to be able to hear back for the process, Dr. Caldwell, that uh, you have uh, that you have created to work with the bureau directors, get to know the bodies of work, um, particularly as you're leading into your org design and strategic planning, it just would help us have some background information into how you're thinking. So if you could share that next time we come together, that would that would be that would be appreciated. Uh, yes, and uh, Dr. Bailey, as you know, has really been working side by side with me, uh, with Assistant Martha Bickley. I've completed the majority of all uh, the required uh, trainings, uh, and uh, I uh, am working on also the uh, accreditation process. Uh, I've been building the uh, the foundational tools and and structure to be able to move forward with. Uh, the strategic planning uh, and evaluation uh, unit, uh, as well as the EPI unit. And uh, over this next month, uh, I'll be uh, really looking carefully uh, and listening carefully about how I can pr present to you uh, an organizational structure that I think will take us through the, the next number of years through the strategic planning process. So. Uh, I uh, am really grateful that I've been able to complete all of the uh, trainings and uh, continue to learn every day. Great, thank you. 
that's all for this section. I would uh, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Can I do a shout out really quick? Oh yes. Just on an upbeat note. I want to say thank you to this department's IT, and particularly Joe Connell, who happens to be here, and Nick Richards, who finally got my computer to stop being allergic to webinars, and it was good. And also, though I have never met her, Sarah K. Johnson and her sit reps. I think the sit reps are really, really helpful. I don't know if you all can do that, but um, if you don't know what I'm about to say, then it means you didn't read it. But she had an extraordinary sense of humor talking about Silly Sally shooing her sheep as a Silly Sally. I'm, so, yeah. Did you see it? I sent her no thank you. Okay, you great. Are. So just, just <laughs> can we acknowledge that we have got some really creative people in many, many serious ways, but also, and that's serious too, because that's great humor. Okay. So. Thank you. Um, any, any, any other comments? Um, our colleagues on the board. It's been a long day. <laughs> so um, I entertain a motion to adjourn. I, I so move. Second. Thank you. Now we can move into uh, the civil service portion of the of our meeting. And Derek, please help me out. Is there anything that I need you to open this? Just hit your gavel and open it. I'm hitting my gavel. I hereby uh, open the civil service board. Simply, yeah. Simply call that session to order. I call that session to order. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Derek. And I'll recognize Jim Diamond. Yes, Vice Chair Franklin and members of the board, including your packet, was a recommendation from the department to tempor temporarily amend civil service rule 5.6 uh, for uh, sick leave. Uh, currently, um, as part of the uh, Family Medical Leave Act and the Families First uh, Act, uh, employees are allowed to use uh, vacation time, um, comp time, uh, and uh, personal time to supplement any uh, pay, uh, cut in pay they would have as, as a result of taking the FMLA. Uh, the department is requesting that sick leave be added to uh, that during the uh, current COVID pandemic, um, just as another option for employees to, uh, to to keep their pay at the regular level, should they uh, need to take time off with regard to uh, a daycare or a school being closed. And we have uh, confirmed that even though if schools are, are open virtually, that's still technically closed uh, as far as this is concerned. So. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions any of you had. If not, uh, we would entertain a motion to approve. I, I do have a, a question. I was wondering if you could give us an idea of how uh, schools opening up, how that's been impacting the workforce. Um, what, what does this look like sort of anecdotally within the workforce? I, I, think, this is, I think this is excellent, this is an excellent amendment. I'm just trying to get a sense of, of the, what the day-to-day -day is for our employees in the health department. I would also assume other metro employees in, across the uh, across the city are facing this as well. Sure. Uh, we as a department did not get a whole lot of guidance uh, from Metro HR, basically saying departments are, are on their own. So. Uh, Les Bauer and our HR director sent out a survey to all of our employees asking for uh, how many would be in, impacted uh, with the school situation. And we had uh, approximately 80 employees respond that they, they are impacted uh, with, uh, with the childcare or schools or some hybrid of that. So uh, as you know how diverse the operations of the department are, some activities uh, lend well to employees working from home and we're doing our best to accommodate those with uh, laptops or, or however uh, we can with regard to changing schedules. So we've uh, had a really good response and done really well with uh, accommodating employees who may have uh, situations with childcare. Um, and, and we've been doing it pretty much all along through the COVID uh, response. Um, we do have we do have a relatively young workforce here at the department, and some have uh, you know very young children or school age children. So um, 
we're we're in good good shape. We we feel like we're doing our best with uh, regard to keeping operations uh, going uh, because we do have a lot of front facing uh, customer service type issues and and areas. So um, we're, we're you know, we can't have a, a broad based situation for everybody who say okay you can all work at home because obviously that's not the case. So. Um, it's it's really employees working with supervisors, supervisors working with bureau directors, and, and trying to find the best solution possible um, to be as accommodating as we can. And, and we feel feel we're in a good position, and we've done that basically since March. But um, with schools opening, it's pre presenting some more challenges. But we're doing our best to work with all employees, kind of on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Comments? Move okay. to approve. A motion to approve by Carol Edmonton. Second. Second by David Frederick. All those in favor? All those opposed? None. Great motion passes. Thank you so much. And the next item was our, our personnel changes for July that were in your packet. Uh, we do not need a motion, but I'd be happy to entertain any questions or discussions related to it. A I was wondering if you could speak to uh, the status changes for our public health nurse one. Uh, you talking about the school health? I'm not sure. Her percentage time. The reason behind their percentage time changes? Sure. Uh, our school, our school, our general school health nurses work at at seventy one percent. So that that is getting uh, a nurse to uh, the, the regular uh, regular schedule for a seventy one percent nurse. Uh, I do not have a great answer for you on why one is working at forty eight percent. That would be considered part time. So I could uh, check into that. Uh, as well and get you a better answer, but I, I don't have that right now. Thank you. Any other, any questions? All right, great, thank you, Jim. Uh, I do appreciate that. Um, entertain a motion to adjourn the public report. Senator. Move, uh, motion by David Frederick, second by Dr. Collins. Yeah. Those in favor? Great. Thank you. Uh, John, thank you, everyone. Um, please stay safe. Um, and um, thank you, Dr. Caldwell and team, um, and the entire Lent Health Department team. Welcome, again. Yes, welcome, Dr. Smith. Welcome, Dr. Smith. Thank you all. Thank you. I, I, I just brushed up on HIPAA law and I stand corrected in, in my <laughs> earlier assessment. So thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone. Please take care. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.